Hello and welcome to Pathways, where you are invited to join me for a visit with leaders in personal development and cultural evolution. This is your host, Paul O'Brien. Now, many of us are struggling to be fully awake in this lifetime, fully human, and open in a way that's even more needed in these troubled times. Quite different from having no boundaries, this openness can transform reactivity, end separation, and lead us to our true authority and guide us with the intelligence of love. Our guest today is Amoda Ma, author of the book, Falling Open in a World Falling Apart. Amoda is a spiritual teacher, a warrior of the heart, sharing a fresh approach to the age old search for spiritual freedom. Her essential teaching teach features a timeless truth that is highly relevant to this moment for contemporary seekers willing to go to the raw edge where spirituality meets humanity. Since 2012, Amoda has been offering meetings and retreats to support and deepen the living of an awakened life. She has been a, a guest, a teacher or a guest teacher at a variety of conferences, featured in several magazines, interviewed for numerous broadcasts and podcasts, and has written four books. Many of her videos are available on YouTube or at her website, which we will mention at the end of today's program. Hello, Amoda, and welcome to the Pathways program. Hi, Paul, a pleasure to be here. Well, in this amazing book, you write, I have come to see that underneath all the seeming convolutions of the spiritual journey is just one issue, the refusal to meet life without resistance. And you use the word openness uh, in the title of your book. How would you define this openness? When I, when I speak about openness, I, 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 point, I point to it rather than define it. Um, let's start with that because it's not a thing. So it has no definition, it has no conceptual understanding. So I, I point to it in various ways. So let me attempt to do that, to do that now. I'm, I'm really speaking about our essential nature, that which is at the core of who we are. Um, it's invisible. Um, which is why it's not a thing. It's a state of awareness, but it's not even a state. It is the essential nature of awareness itself. It's open, silent awareness. The I am, and even that which is prior to the I am, that is always here. That which is prior to all experience, that which is prior to all thought, that which is prior to all uh, feeling, that which is all prior to all sensation. It's that which is here before we're born, that remains after we die. So I'm really pointing to that. Um, and how does your take, how is it different than the way most people understand the concept of being open? Well, most people think or understand being open as something that you do. You can be open or you can be closed. And whilst there is a truth to that, we do have the felt sense, the personal experience of opening when we are in the company or the environment that we feel safe in or that we like, uh, that we can trust. Um, it's a kind of relaxation or softening of our defenses and then we have the sensation the felt sense the experience of closing tightening resisting um, uh, putting up defenses reactivity will come from that fear so there is an opening and closing that takes place on the on the personhood level but what I'm pointing to is something more essential than that that our true nature beyond the personhood is openness itself. Not a personality opening and closing, nothing to do with whether we like something or don't like something, whether we feel comfortable or don't feel comfortable, but the very fact of awareness, the eye that perceives, that experiences, 
that I cannot ever open or close because openness by its very nature is unbounded. It's infinite. It has no boundary. It has no limit. A really good analogy or a really good metaphor is the sky. The sky has no, no end to it. It's infinite. And, and that's our essential nature, which is why the Buddhists point to sky, sky nature or sky mind. Okay. And all right, so somebody is attracted to getting more in touch with this essential openness, this ground of being. How do they do that? And, and, and in your book, you attempt to help teach people how to do that. Well, let me be <laughs> a little pedantic here. I don't actually teach it. Uh, it's not a thing that you do. It's not a process. It's not a method. You can't teach it. I can only point to it in the same way that you can't teach freedom. And that's what I'm, I'm talking about in, in my books or in my teaching. Um, you can only point to it. You can only point to true nature. You can only point to Buddha nature. You can only point to, to fr the freedom of the awakened consciousness. You can't teach it. So mm, my book, Through Those Words, because the book was um, actually created from uh, many of my transcripts, my, my actual discourses given uh, with people at events and gatherings, and then expanded on and, and, and refined. But essentially, it came from those living dialogues. So that's all I'm doing is I'm pointing people to it because it's a recognition. It's a recognition. At some point, we stop looking for freedom or fulfillment in the world of things when, when that's been seen to be futile. And we start looking within and then we look within to thoughts and feelings and try to change those and have positive thoughts and positive feelings and all of that. And we're still looking to things for fulfillment. But what I'm pointing to is to the source of fulfillment, which is the source of everything, that which exists prior to things. And that cannot be taught. It can only be spoken to, pointed to, invited, yeah, because the words speak to the essence of the other, to the essence of you. And there's a recognition in that eventually it's like an arrow that goes in, um, but but yes, it, it's, yeah. <laughs> okay, well, the title of the book is Falling Open in a World Falling Apart. So we have this word falling, which kind of makes me, reminds me of letting go. You know, if, if I'm falling, it's like, it's like, this is a voluntary falling, right? It is a willingness, yeah. Okay. I describe it as falling open because that's a really accurate metaphor of awakening. <laughs> it's a falling open. It's also a useful metaphor for what it takes to live as that awake awakened consciousness because it's all very well having an awakened experience or a glimpse of awakening but then living the truth of that requires the willingness to to fall into the unknown over and over again what does that mean it means going beyond the tendency um, to take a position the, yeah, the ego self the separate self always takes a position um, that may take um, the form of a very strong opinion or a strong belief. Um, and then anything that opposes it will be, um, you know, fought against or seen as the enemy. But it's also an internal position. It's the position of self-righteousness. It could even be like, I feel really uh, victimized or I feel really angry or I feel really sad or whatever it might be. And yet, we take a position of righteousness even in that. And what it takes to live in awakened consciousness or as awakened consciousness is an inner attitude of tenderness, not defendedness, which means 
not being passive, but it means meeting every experience, inc including our own internal landscape of feeling, the felt sense, with a tenderness rather than with a hardness. Yeah? Mm -hmm. So that's, that's kind of, it feels on a, on a very internal level, like a falling into this moment. It's falling into each eternal moment. And does that usually uh, happen as the result of a crisis? Like, it seems like a, you, you tell the story of your personal awakening where, um, you know, you had a lot of fear in your life and, um, you know, and you, you, I'll just quote your book. However seemingly loved I was in my relationships or however seemingly successful I was in my academic career, I carried a gaping hole of emptiness like a hungry ghost that would, demanded to be filled with something. And it became so unbearable that I wanted to die. Can you um, share that with, with, with our listeners? What happened? In that, yeah, that, that refers to the kind of backlog. It's not what, it's not the actual, um, it's not, what happened close to the um, awakening, but it's the backlog, it's the backstory that that was a theme in my life. Um, um, and then when awakening revealed itself, um, it was more like um, an existential void, but less to do with anything that was happening in my life circumstances mm -hmm. like um uh yeah it, the fear wasn't there anymore i'd done a lot of work on that but there was an existential sense of separation um and it appeared like a black hole like a like a void like a void of emptiness um, and I noticed in that moment that the mental acrobatics that, are, that were usually employed to avoid even touching that black hole, being intimate with that black hole, were what had um, been part of my pattern previously in my life. Yeah, in, in looking for love, to fill up the hole, in looking for whatever it might be. I can't remember now, but <laughs> all the things that we usually look for, <laughs> love, recognition, success, um, knowledge, and so on, a uh, sense of belonging. And, and, so I, and so when I saw that, I didn't shrink back from it. I, I, I gave myself to it. I totally gave myself to it, and that felt like a death. And that was the death of the ego self. Right. Now, the second half of the title of your book is In a World Falling Apart. And it would occur to me that this experience of existential void or meaninglessness or just kind of like an endemic fear is in the air right now during this pandemic period. Um, I'm not sure if you were referring to that when you said in a world falling apart. Because somewhere else in your book, you say um, the world's always falling apart. <laughs> so um, it seems that it's really, um, your book seems very timely because I think it's hard for people to be open when they are uh, dealing with these kind of, uh, of uh, existential problems. Yeah, well, I, I didn't write the book for the pandemic or about the pandemic. pandemic. It was, like I said, a series of uh, teachings that I've given over the past four years. Um, so it was a collection of those teachings because they formed the essential teaching. Yeah. Um, yeah, that had formed itself. And um, so it was written or put together before the pandemic as life would have it um, sort of halfway through the completion process, the pandemic happened. So it was very um, uh, apt 
<laughs> perfect timing but that's not what it was originally meant to be because as I say the world is always falling apart what I'm saying with that is nothing is certain yeah nothing is certain it's it's an illusion it's a fiction to believe that you can be open when you think things are going your way but if they're not going your way either on a personal level that's your world yes when you when your world is not going your way when your relationship collapses when your friend is uh, has a, some kind of tragedy when you have some kind of loss you know that's your world is falling apart then but nothing is certain so it's 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 a, it's a fiction it's a fiction created by the ego self to, to say, well, I'll only be open when things are going my way. So now we have this collective situation that has intensified that belief. And so it has intensified fear. It has intensified um, agitation. It has intensified the reactivity uh, of, 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 of self-righteous belief. Um, and I'm not talking about the surface beliefs, just the belief that I'm right in what I see and what I perceive, and therefore I'm right to feel afraid and so on and so on. And what I'm talking about is that freedom is available, um, not as a bypassing, not as a cover up, not as a band aid, but true freedom, which is the only reason to be alive. <laughs> We're all seeking peace. We're all seeking happiness. We're all seeking the ultimate fulfillment even though it's misdirected and turned in it outwardly into, into things. Um, but, but that's the only meaning of life. And that freedom, that fulfillment is available wherever you are. You could be in a jail cell and that freedom is available to you. And of course, the human experience is subject to, to pain, uh, is subject to horror, is subject to tragedy. That's the nature of life life is suffering on that level <laughs> there is death inevitable death we're all we're all going to die we're all dying anyway um there is inevitable loss whether it's the loss of a dream or the loss of a loved one or the loss of your finances there's always ups and downs and so to to pretend that we can be all safe and cozy when apparently things are going our way when all of that is happening anyway <laughs> is is complete fiction so what i'm talking about is being free of the matrix of conditioned belief and that's awakening out of the dream of separation and i know from direct experience that that's the only um joy or peace or true love yeah that is available to us and that doesn't mean that um my life is perfect or that uh, only good things happen although everything is seen as good um in this in this open awakened consciousness um yeah it's not a divide it's not a divided state yeah it's a, it's a very whole and wholesome state that gives birth to the frequency field of love which is really what everyone wants everyone wants a better world and so well, not every well everyone does in their own way yeah some of those ways are, are somewhat distorted but everyone seeks for a world of harmony and for inner harmony and yet it's kind of been sought in the wrong direction <laughs> yeah right right because it's a it's a program of the ego you know this what you said about how there's no certainty and isn't that what our egocentric self wants, you know, we want a permanent solution. We want to solve the problem. <laughs> we want to have it settled and, um, and to be happy as a steady state of reality. And what you're pointing out is, well, sorry, folks, the world is always falling apart because there is no permanence and there is no certainty. And it seems to me that this current climate of chaos and confusion and fear might be a catalyst for a wider awakening. Do you think so? It can be. I've spoken with many people um, that the intensity and the uncertainty and the not knowing what is 
true and what is not true has forced a turning within and a solitude. And that hasn't been a place of um, isolation or, or, or um, you know, sort of shrinking back, but actually a great place of growth and waking up out of fear. Um, so it can be, it can also go the other way. For many people, it's, it's not, it's, it's an entrenchment in, in fear and division. So I, I don't know whether there's a mass awakening or not. Talk to us about the role of tenderness, because I love the way that you bring up tenderness as a way to turn towards fear and to meet fear. Well, again, if we if we um, truly, sincerely, genuinely yearn for freedom, the freedom from comes that comes from knowing true nature, the freedom that comes from um, going to the source of of uh, of who we are or what we are, then tenderness is really the only doorway because anything that has tightness or um, opposition in it creates more division in, internally and then that division gets gets uh, reflected outwardly and uh, oh, the awakening process itself if there is a process that it's not really a process but let's say let's call it that because it happens in an instant, it, it mostly. Um, but the awakening process itself, when it's examined, if it's examined, is actually uh, involves at the core of it, you know, there can be no awakening without it, a profound um, degree <laughs> or level of surrender and what is surrender if not tenderness uh -huh. okay. it's a surrender to what is it's the end of resistance to what is whether that that's the a void of emptiness or incredible existential terror or uh, some kind of darkness that's what awakening is we awaken out of the dream of that of that uh, illusion of fear fear isn't a thing Fear is something that we imagine. Yeah. Fear, we're, yeah, fear is uh, an imagination of what might happen. Right. But that's not what is here now. Yeah, it's not. Yeah, I'm not looking at the the events and the circumstances. I'm talking about the very direct experience of presence. Without presence, there's no awakening. <laughs> yeah, you. I love the way you you write. Fear actually isn't rooted in the reality of now. It's not right. being present. It's the result of coming to a conclusion about the future. Yes, yes. You also write, love is the only thing that is real. Everything else is imagined. That's, That's so beautiful. Right. And I wanna just, we have to, we're, we're running out of time. We've only got a couple more minutes, but maybe you can, we can close with you giving um, our audience uh, some advice other than read your book, which is going to be the advice yeah. I'm going to give them. <laughs> um, it's always so difficult because I, I, I don't give, you know, sort of missives. Um, I, I can only say uh, examine, um, examine, you know, be true to what is your deepest longing. Yeah. I mean, like, look within look within and ask yourself, what is my deepest longing? Not what am I going to do and what am I going to achieve and, and all this stuff. You put that aside, but just go right within and see what your deepest, your innermost really yearns for. When we can start to get a sense of that and wake up to it, yeah, that's a kind of awakening, but it's not the awakening I'm talking about, but let's call it, let's use that language. When you wake up to, your deepest longing, when you when you get in touch with it, in other words, then the fire of truth can start to move in you. And that starts the journey of changing everything. You know, longing is one of those uh, concepts that's kind of a double-edged sword because 
it often has the word unrequited in front of it. And so in that case, it doesn't seem like such a great thing. But tell, tell us uh, how, yours, how you see longing and why it, why it is not like that. Yeah, I mean, again, I have actually written about this in some of my other writings, because we start off on the surface with our, yeah, the things that we don't have and the love we don't have and those kind of things. But when you go down into it, the deepest longing, and I'm going to give the answer here, the deepest longing is to come home. Right. What does coming home mean? It means coming home to our true selves, not our true selves as a, as a nice perfect personality but come home to the deep in ourselves come home to our essential wholeness that was never harmed never tainted never taken never lost it's always been here it's that which you're born with it's the spiritual search but everybody can can, t can taste the fragrance of those words the longing to come home the longing to come home to peace yeah, to stop living in an agitated state, flapping around on the surface, to stop living in fear. These are, this has nothing to do with, with your personality or what you do or what you practice or what you believe in. It's to do with the depth of your being. Yeah, so it's a longing because it appears to be unfulfilled which is why everyone's seeking something. <laughs> yeah, even the search for love or fulfillment in relationship is the longing to come home. Yeah? It just gets hijacked by relationship. <laughs> That's just one example. Thank you so much for that beautiful uh, description of longing and for the book, uh, Falling Open in a World Falling Apart. Um, there's so much more we could explore, but we have run out of time. And let's be sure to tell our listeners about your website, which is www.amodama.com. Amodama is one word, A-M-O-D-A-M-A-A. -A -A. And for those who may have tuned in to the Pathways program late today, this is your host, Paul O'Brien, author of Intuitive Intelligence, a book that shares the theme of Pathways, which is personal and cultural evolution. And don't worry, you can play or share this interview whenever you want via the internet or, or as a free podcast. And I'll tell you how in a minute. Today, we've been visiting with Amoda Ma, author of Falling Open in a World Falling Apart. I want to say thank you to all of our listeners for tuning into Pathways, which is broadcast and streamed on the internet at www.kboo.fm every other Sunday morning at 830 USA Pacific Time. Even better, podcasts of today's show, which you can listen to and forward to others, are available for free at divination.com, spelled D-I-V-I nation.com, as well as via iTunes and other free podcast servers. This is Paul O'Brien reminding you to tell your friends about Pathways Radio and Podcasts. And thanks again to Amoda Ma and to all of you listeners for tuning in and being a part of the Pathways Conversation.